the title of today's message is Be Unleavened. Does anybody know what that means? Be unleavened. Unleavened. I said unleavened. That was my unleavened. Yeah, don't be a lemon for sure. 100% don't be a lemon. Unleavened. It's okay if you don't know because we're going to talk about what that means. So if you have your Bible app open, um, go to Luke 12, verse 1, and I'm going to be reading out of the Passion Translation. So in um, verse 1, it says, By now a crowd of many thousands had gathered around Jesus, so many people pushed to be near him, and they began to trample one another. Jesus turned to his disciples and warned them, Beware of the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. It permeates everything they do and teach like leaven. So that's a lot. But Jesus is basically teaching, and there's like thousands of people, like thousands. That's a lot. They're coming and they're trying to get close to Jesus, and they're so excited that they start trampling people. And when I read this, I don't know why, the first thing that popped into my mind was, um, it's kind of sad, but you remember in The Lion King when, uh, yeah, yeah, the stampede. But, okay, so you know how sad that is. Now imagine people who are trying to get to Jesus doing that to you. You're just trying to get to Jesus, and people are, like, stomping you into the ground, because you're like in the crowd just trying to get close to Jesus because there's a thousand people everywhere and whatever. But that's what's going on. Y- yeah, but like you're getting killed pretty much like stepped on. <laughs> but I think it's crazy because when Jesus sees that this is happening, he doesn't, his first response is he doesn't look, he doesn't address the crowd. He doesn't address the thousands. He looks at the disciples because the disciples are following him, right? He looks at them and he says, beware of the hypocrisy of the Pharisees because it permeates everything they do and teach like leaven. So I know that's a really big statement and you're probably like, okay, I know what hypocrisy means to be a hypocrite. I know what that means. But what does permeate and leaven have to do with anything, right? Like I I know I've heard of the Pharisees. They're not the best people on the earth. And he's talking about them, warning them about them. But what what does leaven and all that other stuff mean? So leaven, if you Google it, it says a substance, typically yeast, that is used in dough to make it rise. So if you look at this picture, on the right, there's a picture of what looks like communion bread. So you know how we have communion in the little cups and we get that little cracker, that's what people call them. That's unleavened bread. It's just straight up like bread dough without yeast. So it's flat, kind of like a tortilla almost. And then you have leavened bread on the left which just looks like a basically like a really basic piece of bread that you can get at the bakery you know you go and it's all fluffy and warm and that's what leavened bread looks like it's all fluffy and because they put yeast and it makes it rise it makes the dough like expand and become big and yeah but permeate huh yeah like that (laughs) fat (laughs) yeah it becomes fat it's not thin but then permeate when jesus says it permeates everything Permeate, when you Google it, means spread throughout something or to pervade. And I Googled it. I didn't even have to look for that definition. Like if you go to Google and you type in permeate, it literally says to spread throughout something or to pervade it. So now going back to verse 1. Now you you understand what leaven is and you know what permeate means now, right? Okay, so read it again. Beware of the hypocrisy of the Pharisees because it permeates everything they do and teach like leaven. So as far as we know, leaven is not bad because leaven makes bread, I mean, I guess doughier, you know, like softer. It's not like a disc. It's more like, you know, like a fluffy piece of bread. Right. But in this context, he's saying it in a negative um, way, which we did read that when it talks about permeating something, permeate means to um, spread throughout something, but almost in like a pervasive way, like in a negative, not good way. And I believe this would be the example of it because he's saying that although, you know, the Pharisees are here, but beware of their hypocrisy because they can't help. But yes, they're in the crowd and they're following Jesus, but they're full of hypocrisy as they're here. And it's spilling over not only into their actions, but even in, in everything they do and everything they teach. So they're here and they're in the crowd following Jesus, but they're still hypocrites at heart. And he's saying, beware of that. Because you might think, oh, well, they're in the crowd. They're, they must be following Jesus. But I believe that when he saw all the thousands of people um, trampling other people, he's like, wait, that's not me. I would never trample someone. 
Think about it. Do you see Jesus stomping someone to get somewhere? Do you see him like running over someone to get to one place to the other? I could never see Jesus doing that. But these people are here and they're in the crowd and they're stomping on people trying to get to Jesus. And he's saying these are the people that you need to watch out for because they're hypocrites. They're the people that you'll see on Sunday. And, and he says they're teaching. So they're preaching at the church. They're the ones on the pulpit. They're not the ones in the back that, you know, participate. They're the ones on the pulpit preaching but they're full of hypocrisy. He's saying, watch for people like that. And I know that it's not news to us, but just because somebody has a platform, whether it be a physical pulpit, a church, or even a a social media platform, doesn't mean that what they're saying is authentic. Sometimes people might even be saying the right things, but that doesn't mean that it's in their heart to the fullness that they're living it authentically. For example, the Pharisees were like really into preaching the word, but they weren't I guess, it, you know it wasn't really in their heart if they're trying to get to Jesus and their means of getting to Jesus is stomping on people. <laughs> like that's not, you're preaching one thing, but you're doing another. You're preaching love and kindness, but then you're running over people and pushing people because you're trying to get to Jesus. Like that's not how it works. And that's what he's saying. But then in verse two, he keeps going. He says, everything hidden and covered up will soon be exposed for the facade is falling down and nothing will be kept secret for long. In verse 3, whatever you have spoken in private will be public knowledge. And what you have whispered secretly behind closed doors will be broadcast far and wide for all to hear. Now, I know that a while ago, I can't remember how long ago, weeks, months, it's been a while. But I know we talked about pure hearts and the importance of pure hearts. And if I can't sum it up to you in one big paragraph, these two verses can sum it up for you. Because it's saying everything that you've done in secret, everything that you've said, everything that you've said in um, behind closed doors, it's going to be broadcast and everybody's going to know. That's scary. Because I know that when we go home, there's conversations that we have that we don't have the confidence to have here, which is okay. Like that's normal. That's fine. Because we have family and, you know, we live with our family. So It's different than us being here because what do we see each other like three times a week, maybe four times a week sometimes. And we're still family, but there's people that we live with, you know, our parents, siblings, that they know us better than anybody else because they see you, you know, when you're not dressed up and when you're not ready for church and when you're not worshiping. Right. Okay, but he's saying that everything that you do in secret matters. Everything, not just what you say, but what you do. Because whatever you do, it's going to be broadcast in public. For example, let's say that, you know, you you talk about Jesus and you tell people that you're a Christian. But if you don't spend time with Jesus at home, it's going to be broadcast and made public. Not that I'm going to say anything because, I mean, I, I wouldn't know unless the Holy Spirit tells me. But when you worship passivity, pass, right, passivity, like being passive speaks volumes. Your actions speak volumes. You can go around telling people, trying to prove to people how much you love Jesus, but your actions and your responsiveness to when Jesus walks into the rooms speaks more than, oh, I love Jesus and I care about Jesus and he means everything to me. But when he walks into the room, your response to him is what matters because then it begins to shout and declare, this is the love that I have for him in secret. And now it's being broadcasted in front of the people. And the reason it almost seems like this is a tangent from what was happening, it's actually not. Because the reason he's saying this is, look at the Pharisees. They're saying we love God and we care about God. Jesus walks into the room and they're over here stomping on people, running people over to get to him. That's not Christ-likeness. And a lot of people will say, well, you know, that's in the time of Jesus. We don't stomp on people to get to church. Yeah, maybe not physically, but what about emotionally? What about psychologically? What about mentally? It's not okay to manipulate people to come to church. It's not okay to manipulate people to want to worship God better if it's not in their heart. I'm going to be honest. If you don't want to worship, you're not going to worship. If you don't want more of God, you're not going to get more of God. Because the Bible says in Luke 11, ask, it will be given to you. Knock, the door will be opened to you. And um, seek and you will find. So if you're seeking for God, if you're looking for God, if you're hungering for God, you're going to find him. With or without me. I'm just being honest. With or without me. Like, God forbid tomorrow I disappeared off the face of the earth. Your desire for God is not limited on me. It shouldn't be because if it is, then I'm your God and God is not your God. And that's what he's saying. He's saying, look, you're you're worshiping the practice and the arts, but it's not in your heart because when I show up, you're not reflecting who I am. You're treating people terribly. 
You're stopping over them, pushing them out of the way, and you're thinking, oh, but this is how much I love him. Why would you trample someone to try and get to Jesus? That's like, you know, I remember when my dad used to travel a lot, and he would come home from his trips, and, you know, naturally me and Jacob and Sam and my mom would be excited for him to walk through the door. And imagine me being obviously bigger than my brothers. I just push Sammy onto the ground, throw Jacob against the wall just to hug dad. And it, it sounds funny, and even imagining it is funny. But in reality, imagine us doing that every time Jesus walks in the room. You know, like imagine if like, <laughs> yeah, you just run into someone or, or imagine it on like a broader scale. Like if the worship team's worshiping and I run up to the stage and I push Rebecca over and she falls over because she's not focused on me. She's trying to worship Jesus or I come and I snatch Yasmin's violin out of her hand. That's going to be crazy because she's like, I'm trying to worship the Lord. I'm trying to do what you're trying to do. Right. But that's what he's saying. Because really, if you have Jesus in your heart, it's going to show. You don't have to tell me. I'm going to see it. And that's what he's saying. These people talk so much game about God, but you can't see it in their life. And that's what he's saying. Please be careful what you do in secret. Because you can talk about God all you want. But at the end of the day, your receptivity to God walking into the room is what's going to reflect. Okay, do you really love God? Because if you do, you're going to love him in private. And only from loving him in private will he produce the fruit of the spirit inside of you. Not that going to church is wrong and being in community is wrong because it's a part of it. But really, God likes to produce things inside of you when no one's around. Because then he can't shame you. Because how many know that, you know, we've all made mistakes before. And sometimes it's better for us to make mistakes and somebody to pull us aside in private. Rather than put us in front of the whole class and say, hey, look what they did. They messed up and they did something wrong. Jesus is not about that. And he didn't even call them out specifically. He just said, look, the Pharisees. He didn't call him out by name, thankfully, because he's not trying to shame people. But he's saying, hey, these Christians over here are not being authentic. So he'll never call you out in public and shame you. And I know pastors do that. And that's so horrible. That's not wrong. And that's not godly at all because Jesus never did it. But at some point, Jesus will pull you to the side and say, hey, you're messing up in this area. And it's because you're not cultivating him in private, in secret. And that's what these people were doing. So whenever they would show up to church on Sunday, their hearts weren't authentic. They were full of hypocrisy. And in verse four, he goes on to say, listen, my beloved friends. Now, remember who he's addressing. He just saw all these Pharisees stomping on people, being crazy and, and bad. But he didn't address the Pharisees. He addressed the disciples. He's looking at the disciples. So he's not looking at this mess going on over here. How many times have you ever been to church and you see like, and I, I don't want to say like this church, but I mean like growing up, I, I personally have been to different churches where you see people doing stuff that they probably shouldn't be doing. And, you know, wh whatever it is, I'm not going to go into detail, but I feel like in one way or another, we've seen people and, and even here because we're not a perfect house. You know, maybe you've seen somebody treating somebody bad and you're like you go up to that person. You're like, hey, stop, whatever. That's just an example. But when Jesus saw what the Pharisees were doing, he didn't just go out and say, hey, you guys no. He gave his complete attention to the disciples. He didn't address the Pharisees. He didn't say, hey, Pharisees, listen to me. No, he said, disciples, listen to what I have to say. Why did he address the disciples? Because of those two words, listen, my beloved friends. So you can be a fan and you can be a follower, but he's called us to be beloved friends. There are a lot of people that are fanatics and they're fans and they're participators and they're spectators. You ever play a video game? I know I've played a dozen video games when you play online and when you die, it gives you the ability to spectate other players because you died in the game, right? So you're watching what, like if I'm playing with Jacob and we're on a team and I die in the game, I can spectate what Jacob's doing. Okay, God didn't call you to be a spectator. He didn't call you to just watch, oh, look at what God is doing in her life and his life. And No, God wants to use you. God's trying to get in your life, in your heart. He doesn't just care about the people sitting next to you. He cares about you a lot. So that's what he's saying. He's like, don't even worry about these guys. I feel like God was saying that to Jesus. Don't even address this madness. Look at these beloved friends, these disciples that I've given you and talk to them because they're going to listen to you. He didn't just say friends. I've had a lot of friends and they, they stopped being my friends because they didn't listen to what I have to say and got tired of me telling them, hey, if you keep doing this, it's not going to work out for you. And well... Let's just say it didn't work out for them and they didn't listen, but they, they separated themselves. It's a long story. But, but when I have beloved friends, see, beloved friends are different. Beloved friends aren't just school friends. Beloved friends are people that I can see all the time and they value my opinion. 
Even if they don't do what I say, they're like, wait, there's something on what you're saying. And it's vice versa. I have beloved friends that I don't have to say anything, but they speak into my life and they encourage me. And every time I see them, I want to look more like Jesus just by being around them. That's a beloved friend. So all these people were trying to pose and be like, oh, we're friends of Jesus too. No, you're not because you're not acting like him. But he looked at the, the disciples and he's like, no, you're my beloved friends. And that's why I'm addressing you. So if you ever feel like sometimes, you know, God is like not picking on you, but kind of getting deep in your mess. And then meanwhile, the person next to you is like doing a hundred more bad things than you. It's because he's calling you higher. Not that he doesn't care about the person next to you, but he wants you to be a beloved friend. He doesn't want you to be a fan because fans have merch. Fans have posters. But friends, we go out to eat with friends. We do life with friends. I don't want a Jesus poster on my wall. I want him to come into my room. You see the difference? So he says, beloved friends, don't fear those who may want to take your life but can do nothing more. It's true that they may kill your body, but they have no power over your soul. The one you must fear is God, for he has both the power to take your life and the authority to cast your soul into hell. Yes, the only one you need to fear is God. So I underlined three parts of verses four through five. One, we already talked about beloved friends. But then number two, it says they have no power over your soul. God has given you power over what comes into you. Just like you have complete authority over your life. Right now after church, everybody's going to go eat lunch. You have complete authority to eat whatever you want. Granted, your parents might say, hey, we're going to go eat this because they're paying for the bill. But if you eat a piece of, let, let's say you go to a Mexican restaurant and they order fajitas and you eat one bean, it's because you chose not to eat everything on your plate, right? Am I being wrong? And your parents might get mad at you because they still have to pay for all the food you didn't eat, right? Okay, so just like you have authority to eat and to consume and control over what comes in your body physically, spiritually, you have the same authority. What, who's speaking into your life? Who's, who's giving you like life? Who's preaching to you? And I know obviously I'm an example. I'm one, but I shouldn't be the only one. Because if I am, oof, that's not good. No offense. I mean, I'm just being honest because I don't, if I, if you ask me that question, like back at me, I wouldn't say, oh, it's just my pastors. Like they're one or they're, they're like a, a, a few, but I have way more people speaking into my life. Why? Because if I want to receive everything that God has for me, I'm, I'm not just going to consult a few people. I'm going to be like, God, let me find every single person on this planet that's walking in the fullness of God. Because let's be honest, in this time period, they didn't have Instagram. They didn't have TikTok. They couldn't follow people online that lived hundreds of miles away. But you can. If they wanted a worship service, they had to ask their neighbors or their family members or whoever could play an instrument. Because like me, I can't play an instrument. And if I lived in this time period, well, we got to wait till the worshipers show up. Not you. You can put up a video on your phone, on your TV, at home, at school. You can listen to music everywhere you go. Worship is always accessible to you. But to them, they had to wait. They had to wait for somebody to preach the word. But you guys can look up YouTube videos. There's Bethel, Upper Room. Those are some of the ones that I listen to. But uh, Jesus Image is also another one. They're great. But um, yeah, he's saying you, they have no power over your soul. So they might like call you names and say you'll never amount to anything and do all this okay but they don't have power over what's on the inside of you what you're receiving because only you do so if you're full of the holy spirit it's because you said yes but if you're not full of the holy spirit guess what it's because you're resisting him you're rejecting him because I know some people make, mis uh, not mistakes, some people make the error and they say, well, God, I feel like a lot of people right now aren't really serving God. No, there are. It's just sometimes we get lazy and we get tired of looking for real people. Trust me, they're there. But do you really want to sit by them when they start speaking? Because I know that if I was in this time period when Jesus ascended and I had those complaints and I said, God, really, who's preaching the gospel? And this fisherman this guy who a year ago was the one that gave me all this fish for my family is trying to tell me about Jesus. Would I receive him? Would I receive Peter realistically? The guy that last year I was the one that bought hundreds of fish for so my family could eat all their food. And now he's trying to tell me about Jesus and the kingdom and eternity, right? It, it's crazy. Sometimes God will use the least, the last person you would expect to preach the gospel to you to preach the gospel to you. And I'm not just saying to the extent that you're saved because, yes, you guys have received Jesus. But I'm saying God will use whoever he wants to get his point across to you. He'll use anybody. And, of course, people in church. But I'm saying even in the world, 
There will be people that God may send that they might not say Jesus every five seconds, but they'll, they'll be used by God to help to build your character, to help to build everything that God wants for your life, you know? Because, I mean, God used Judas. I'm just going to be honest. Judas was a backstabber and a liar and a hypocrite, and God still used him. So I think he can use people in school that hate us, you know? I'm just being honest, right? But, yeah. So they have no power over your soul, but you do. So watch, just like you watch what you eat, you know, you try to lose weight, try to eat healthy things. Make sure you're eating healthy spiritual word. Don't just be like, oh, what they're saying is really nice, but is it growing you? Like, are you really wanting to encounter more Jesus? Or are you just getting excited about what God is doing? There's a difference. Like I said, fans, family. Fans get excited when their favorite musician comes to their town. Family goes out to eat with them and knows how they're doing internally. So be vulnerable with God. Don't be, don't be a fan. Be his family. And the last part, the only one you need to fear is God. A lot of people get this twisted because they think, oh, fear, like I need to be afraid of him. No, the fear of God is different than the fear of spiders and the fear of heights and the fear of all this stuff. Because when we think of fear, we think of those things, like whatever you're afraid of and you just can't do right. But the fear of God is different. The fear of God is literally saying, "Okay, I have a billion options on how I can live my life, but I'm afraid to choose any other option apart from God. I'm afraid to take God's place as first in my life and fill it with something else. That's the fear of God. You're not afraid of him like he's going to crush you and destroy you because that's not, that's not right. And a lot of people preach that. They're like, you should be afraid of God. Listen, if God wanted to kill you, he, he would have done it already. You're alive because he created you and he loves you and he wants you on the earth. We're not here by accident. The Bible says that we were created in the image of the Trinity. So God didn't just spawn you on the earth and say, oh, let's see how this person does. No, he created you with the intention of you loving him and serving him, which you have a choice to. You don't have to. Everybody has a choice. But when you choose to love him, you also choose the fear of God, meaning God comes first, meaning I can't let anything compete with God because the moment I do that is the moment that I'm not fearing God anymore. I'm fearing man. I'm fearing people's opinions. I'm fearing what people might say about me. But that's not the fear of God. The fear of God says, I don't care what people think about me. I don't care what my family thinks about me. I don't care what people say about me. And that doesn't mean you don't honor your family and you don't honor people. But I'm saying, don't let other things compete with God's place in your heart because he has to be first. That's the fear of God. It's not being afraid that he's going to strike you with a lightning bolt. That's not it. So remember this. Do not trample people. Or in other words, don't crush their love and desire for God. You can't trample someone and love them. So if you're ever in a situation when somebody, and this is hypothetical, it it doesn't have to just be at church. But let's say someone at church offends you for whatever reason. Like they do something mean. They treat you wrong. We've probably all experienced this at some point, sadly. But the way that we respond matters. Not just the fact that they did it. Yes, it's bad that they treated you bad, whatever. But how did you respond to it? Are you going to do the same thing and reflect it back to them? Are you going to trample them and say, well, you don't belong here. You're not reflecting Jesus and just accuse them, ABC. Or are you just going to, in silence and in humility, just take it and pray for them and love them and just say, you know what? Hey, they hated Jesus, so I'm not really surprised if they're going to treat me bad. They crucified Jesus. So getting anything less than that is really not that big of a deal. I'm just being honest. Like people making fun of us and making up stuff about us that's not true is not as bad as the way that they did it to Jesus. Because he is authentic. Jesus is supreme authenticity. He didn't just come saying, oh, you know, this is who I am. No, he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He came 1,000% reflecting his Father's kingdom upon the earth. And I know for me, I'm just being honest, I'm, I'm working on that. I want to become the image of Jesus on the earth. And to an extent I am because I've received the Holy Spirit. I've received Jesus in my heart. But how many know that we're walking in a process? Just because we receive Jesus and we say the prayer and we're like, God, you have my life doesn't mean we're perfect and we make no mistakes. We all fall. But how do you respond to each other's falls? How do you respond to when you're treated badly? And like I said, it's not just church. Because see, yes, it's kind of bad when it happens at church because you would think people would have an understanding like, oh, you know, but this is not how Jesus would act. But what about when it happens in like outside of church? You know, I've had people in school that treated me badly and they were atheists or agnostics and they wanted nothing to do with God. And, and all I could do was, God, how do you want me to respond to this? 
And he would tell me, he's like, just love them. And with this word specifically, don't trample them. Because maybe they've been preached a hundred sermons on why God is real, why God exists, but they've never experienced love authentically. And that's what he's saying. These people knew how to preach the message, but they didn't know how to get people to encounter love authentically. So be authentic. Be real. Don't just tell people about Jesus. Let them experience it. Be humble. You know? And like I said, it's a process. I'm not saying, oh, I'm just going to be humble now. No. But when you spend more time with God, you become like God. When you read more and understand who God is, you can't help but become more like God. So, yeah. Just as leaven permeates bread to be puffed up, hypocrites are full of themselves and do not live what they preach. How many of you guys ever been to like a bakery and you've gotten a piece of bread and it looks so big, but then you squeeze it and you realize that it's full of nothing but air. And you're like, oh my God, I, I just got the biggest bread in this bakery and I squeezed it and now there's nothing but air. And it's like a little ball in your hand. And like five seconds ago, it, you, he had two hands to pick it up because it was so big. That's how hypocrites are. Like on the outside, they're like, oh my God, look at how much I know. Look at how much. And then, and then you squeeze them a little bit. You give them a little bit of attention and you realize, man, you don't live what you're talking about. You're, you're saying you're full of this, but you're just full of hot air. Like you're nothing like what you say you are. Don't be like that. And I know we love bread. Trust me, I love bread. Bread is not the problem. But he's saying don't be full of yourself. Don't, don't be leavened. Be unleavened. Watch what you say and do in private. And we talked about that. Hypocrites are not beloved friends of Jesus. That's a big deal. Hypocrites are not beloved friends of Jesus. Anybody can preach about Jesus, but only beloved friends, only beloved friends get to know the real Jesus. Just saying. Issues and problems are temporary, but God has authority over your eternity. Don't listen to what people have to say about you. Don't listen. If it's not from the heart of God, what does it matter anyway? Really? And even if they, even if they, um, what's the word? Not encourage you, but I hate flattery. I hate when people tell me I'm doing a good job and I'm not. Like, just be honest with me. If I'm doing terrible, please have the decency to tell me, hey, you need to work on this. Because even in that, that's godly. Now do it with kindness. <laughs> don't just slam people. Like we said, don't trample people and say, you suck. You shouldn't be on the worship team, right? Okay. But yeah, fearing God is not being afraid of him. It's having the courage to trust him in all things. So remember, the Pharisees, it's not that they didn't believe in God. It's not that they struggled with the idea of, of the reality of God. But it's just that they didn't have the fear of God. They couldn't discern if God was standing in front of them or if he left the room. They were just there for the hype. They were just there because people, stuff was happening. And, and if anything, they were there to accuse Jesus before, before anything else. Before they would love him and acknowledge him for who he was, they were there to accuse and I don't know about you, but I've met a lot of people that come to church and they're not professional wor worshipers, but they're professional accusers. They come to accuse everything. Well, the worship's not that great. Well, the teaching's not that great. Well, the pastors aren't that great. Great. And what about you? Are you perfect? No? Okay, great. Then get in line because we're all in the process. We're all running after Jesus, right? I mean, at least I am. We are, right? So just get in line.